I first came to Nepal in about 1989 or 1990 and since then my uh, professional life has been working on um, mostly infectious diseases but increasingly non-infectious diseases but global health and I uh, spent 20, 18 years living in Vietnam um, and moved back to London six years ago and um, what I'm interested in is where there are uh, inequitable challenges on health which I can see there's a chance we will get worse rather than getting better and where I think that science um, science as part of society can actually make a difference and I think all of that is true in Nepal whilst my work was based on typhoid <coughs> in Vietnam Buddha quite rightly said that actually, in truth, what he termed the typhoid capital of the world was actually South Asia. And, and he's right in that. Um, the burden of that disease in this part of the world is massive. And, uh, and so I came in and, um, and, uh, from 2004 and, and that started a partnership and collaboration that has been ongoing. Um, in the last, what, 15, 16 years, and uh, started with typhoid, but then has worked now in other areas, uh, um, areas of high altitude sickness, but, but also um, other, other infections, particularly that are important here in Nepal. In some ways, Nepal is a sort of um, microcosm of all of the changes that are happening in, in particularly low and low middle income countries. Nepal will, will suffer in coming years from major epidemics of dengue, um, of course HIV, um, uh, pneumonias, all of these long-standing infectious diseases. But Nepal is also now having to deal with the double whammy of infectious diseases which have not disappeared and the increasing burden that's posed by um, the so-called non-communicable diseases. The real problem for countries such as Nepal is, is you're dealing with both. You're dealing with both at the same time and, and those require quite different public health measures. They require governments to actually make informed evidence-based policy decisions. Dengue, I think, is is the sort of um, is the is is the infectious disease of the 21st century, <laughs> because it is driven by all of the changes that we're going to see in the 21st century, um, and 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 those are environment change, climate change, um, urbanisation, uh, travel and movement of people, and therefore vectors. Cities like Kathmandu are perfect breeding grounds for the mosquito. Um, Kathmand Kathmandu's climate is changing, that's obvious I think to everybody. Uh, the city is growing almost exponentially, it's growing in a relatively haphazard way. If you put together climate change, the environment change, the mosquito gradually spreading further north from India into the Terai in, in Nepal and now increasingly into Kathmandu, it's inevitable that Kathmandu and the, rest, and, and the low, lower lands of Nepal will suffer from dengue outbreak. In my professional career, say last 35 years, I have never been more optimistic about tuberculosis. HIV has gone from being a death sentence in a few weeks, in what, 30 years, one person's career, that's been transformed into a, a difficult disease, but one where you can manage long term. In malaria over the last 20 years, there's been amazing progress with the coming of uh, uh, insecticide bed nets, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, Chinese herbal drug called artesinate, which has transformed malaria, most important malaria drug ever invented. TB has not made that progress. Um, we are using drugs, we're using a diagnostic test which was invented in the 19th century. There has been no new drugs for tuberculosis until for, for 40 years. Um, uh, we have not really understood how it transmits one person to another uh, until about two or three years ago when 
that was transformed. Um, and I believe now that uh, with the coming of the new pipeline of drugs, which are now being used um, in South Asia, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the treatment period will shorten um, and that will make treatment much easier. But perhaps more important than that, um, there is for the first time, I think, the possibility uh, of a tuberculosis vaccine which will prevent infection and prevent disease. Uh, state bite is the, is the biggest um, disease, if we call it a disease, the biggest disease nobody's ever heard of. Um, and I think it's true. It, it, it affects in, in mostly impoverished people in rural communities who have no political voice. Snake bite treatment is, is still using 19th century or early 20th century interventions. The snake bite treatment is expensive to produce, difficult to access, not available to anybody really that needs it. So what we're interested in doing is, is transforming that and bringing the technologies that have been used in cancer and uh, other infectious diseases to use that technology to produce um, a, a, a treatment that, that counteracts the snake venom. The next one which we're about to launch um, is on mental health. It has not attracted um, much investment, it's not perhaps attracted young people to come into it, it's often in, in different parts of the health system, um, separate hospitals, it, it's been, it's been uh, on the sidelines. Uh, um, mental health tragically everywhere in the world still carries enormous stigma. Um, and so we've not had the investment in science, we've not had the investment in public health, we've not had the investment in clinical care of people, and we haven't had the advances in treatment or prevention. And so this is a health issue, it's a public health issue, I believe it's a, uh, an issue of social justice, and it's also a, a, an economic issue. And what we want to do with um, our, our investment is to try and make sure that we transform mental health from being an issue of stigma and no progress, to but one where people are willing to talk about it, it becomes a normal part of society and we can make scientific and health progress that will actually reduce the burden of this uh, massive problem for the world.